Hi, good day, and uh, welcome to this episode of Focus On with myself, Fifi Peters. Uh, today, we are looking at uh, recent developments coming out of the Standard Bank Group. They recently partnered with uh, South African state-owned companies as well as National uh, Treasury to take the country's investment proposition to the Middle East. Through its annual investment summit in Dubai, Africa's largest lender buy assets hopes to mobilize capital from the Gulf region for investment in infrastructure projects at home. Joining me to discuss some of the outcomes of the 2024 investment summit and also potential prospects, I'm joined by Kenny Fiesler, the CEO of Corporate and Investment Banking at Standard Bank. Kenny, thanks so much for joining us in studio. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. I think uh, uh, this time last year or towards the end of 2023, uh, one of the key outcomes that came out from the summit that you hosted last year was the uh, deal described as groundbreaking that uh, you partnered with, with a, uh, a private lender over in the UAE to uh, essentially raise liquidity for the Development Bank of Southern Africa, some $255 million, if I am correct, but correct me if I'm wrong. What were the key outcomes then of this year's uh, conference? This year's conference, we have seen a much more higher interest uh, on Middle Eastern investors uh, to partner with South African institutions. We are already working on four deals, and I think these are likely to close in the next uh, two months or so. Unfortunately, we can't announce them as yet until such time that they have closed and the clients have concerted to us announcing them. Uh, so it's a, actually a sea change if you think about it. From last year where there was interest, deals concluded, to now within a month of the conference taking place, four deals already at the stage where there are actual negotiations on terms between investors and South African companies. What do you think uh, was the biggest factor or biggest factors then that raised the tide, as you just uh, describe it as sea change, but that raised the tide in terms of investment interest in doing more business in South Africa from the Middle East? I think it's a few factors. The first has to do with the appetite of investors in the Middle East. Uh, they are looking for new areas of growth. They want to diversify their own economies. And Africa is closely located to the Middle East. It has cheap asset values. There's massive opportunities for infrastructure development. And because these investors are looking for large investment opportunities, naturally, South Africa becomes the starting point for that uh, sort of opportunity. From a South African point of view, I think some of the changes that we've seen regulations being loosened and opened up for investment in the energy space. Some of the contemplated changes in the logistics sector, i.e. allowing private sector participation in the ports. And there's a whole range of other opportunities that we think are likely to fall or rather to follow if you open up the energy sector, you fix your logistics and that will stimulate far greater economic growth. And investors can see that and they would want to be part of that action and capture those opportunities as early as possible. What about the politics? Because your summit this year happened after the uh, pivotal national vote here in South Africa and the a sea change political outcome in terms of the uh, ruling African National Congress uh, losing its majority and being forced to share power in a good way, we've seen the financial markets react positively to the prospects of a government of national unity and what it could potentially bring. How has the uh, change in South Africa's political dispensation, in your view, influenced uh, the uh, way investors in the Middle East are looking at the country? Investors are looking for regulatory certainty. They want an environment that is uh, supportive of the participation uh, of uh, business, in some respect a pro-business environment, not in a negative sense, but in a much more positive sense. And clearly the outcome of the elections in South Africa uh, has in a sense assured them that there would be continuity in the regulatory reform that was started even before the elections. They've also been comforted by the fact that the nature of the government that has emerged is a government that brings together parties that are committed to the continuation of that reform program. And they think that's likely to effectively spare South African growth even much more faster and ensure that some of the initiatives that were started are implemented at a much more faster pace uh, with far more greater effectiveness. There's also an interesting difference between 
international investors and local investors. Mm. South Africa is compared to a whole variety of countries. So risk is relative to what they see in other emerging markets. And we tend to find that international investors tend to worry less about things like a government of national unity, mm. if it has the right partners, because they've seen it in many countries where they operate. I mean, you look at Europe and how many countries are run by coalition governments uh, of sorts. Uh, it's quite a lot, including the bigger sort of economies of Europe. That does not on its own scare investors. It is the nature of the parties that tend to determine the attitude that they adopt. And uh, even within uh, international or amongst international investors, there's a difference uh, as to how they also view risk. There was a recent study that was commissioned by Brand South Africa, which showed that uh, international investors from the Middle East uh, look on the continent, South Africa, a lot more favorably than uh, those in Europe or the US, for instance, according to the study, of course, that was commissioned. But coming back to the deals that you did announce, so you can't give us a lot of details. There's still talks that are happening behind the scenes. But can you give us uh, a bit of a color as to where the uh, interest within our infrastructure complex is right now. I mean, there's roads, there's the ports, there's rail and logistics and needs that you did make reference to, as well as energy. Where in the infrastructure complex are you seeing a lot more interest to want to participate by investors in the Gulf region? If one looks at the meetings that we've had and the sense of enthusiasm and a sense of agency, from the investors that we met, there is no doubt that energy remains by far uh, the most attractive area where investors would like to participate. Initially, the focus was more on the IPPs and some of the opportunities that are presented by sort of uh, distributed energy, broadly speaking. There's a far more greater interest now to even participate in the building and the rollout of the transmission infrastructure, which is critical in unlocking areas like the Northern Cape, the coastal areas, so that you could have massive development of renewable energy projects that have access to the grids and consequently you can then distribute electricity to the rest of the country. The second area is in the logistics. The work that is being done by government and Transnet to bring private sector in the management of the ports, the discussions that are taking place in sorting out our rail infrastructure, and in particular, to ensure that uh, mining companies can export their goods to relative ease. The motor vehicle sector can increase this production and take their cars to the international markets. The agri sector, which has seen some favorable conditions, but unfortunately has been unable to take full advantage of that opportunity because of our rail infrastructure. All of those are seen as massive opportunities by Middle Eastern investors. So there's a huge interest in the logistics sector. And I think it's just a matter of time before we see that resulting in massive initiative and investment and consequently the unlocking of our logistic opportunities. We also met with investors who are interested in mining. Mm. That is also not surprising. I mean, if you think about energy, you can't really accelerate access to energy. You can't accelerate energy transition without being able to access the minerals that are required to build solar panels, batteries that you require for storage, the cabling that is required to transmit these electrons and so on. So there's an interest in mining. The fourth area is agriculture. That also should be fairly obvious in that the Middle East is largely a desert. Uh, the bulk of their food is imported. Sure. These companies see opportunities to effectively participate in businesses that farm and produce food in Africa so that they can supply that to the Middle Eastern market. So I think there are a lot of opportunities that are likely to follow if we are able to unlock some of the infrastructural issues which will then make it easy for the movement of goods between the two regions. I do know that uh, some local farmers are, are pretty excited about the uh, opportunity of exporting their beef uh, over to that uh, part of the uh, world, just uh, uh, speaking to your point around the opportunities in agriculture. But circling back to the regulatory environment, uh, you did make reference of the fact that there had been positive reform in the energy landscape uh, by way of removing the uh, cap on self-generation uh, for private investment. Uh, you've also alluded to 
the uh, start of positive reforms in rail and logistics. But what is the assessment of the current investors you're talking to right now, and maybe even prospective investors, about the regulatory environment and what more is needed to change, to change their interest into actual realizable opportunity? A lot of ground has been covered. I mean, I think sometimes, I mean, when, because we are too close to the detail, we do not take the step back to look at where we were, say, five, uh, six years ago, to where we are now. Think about the first uh, IPP projects, how long it took for those to be adjudicated, how long it took for ESCOM to sign the power purchasing agreement, the regulatory uncertainty around pricing, uh, and some of the delays that were just inherent in the entire sort of implement implementation and execution of those process. That was an indication of firstly, a regulatory environment that was not first settled, and secondly, an indication of a bureaucratic process that was not effective. We now have a regulatory environment that's far more certain. There are certain elements that still need to be sorted out, i.e., how are we going to wield these electrons? What's the pricing regime if the producer is located in the coastal area and their customer is located in the northern part of the country? Mm -hmm. How do you make sure that pricing is managed in an effective manner and it does not have unnecessary leakage? Uh, of revenue as well as unnecessary cost being burden onto the end customer at the end of the day. Those are being sorted out and are becoming much more clearer as we move forward. The biggest obstacle now is more the effectiveness in the adjudication of these initiatives as well as the speed at which new IPP initiatives are launched and expanded by government. We should be awarding IPP contracts um, uh, every single year in the order of thousands uh, of megawatts because this economy needs more electricity, not just to deal with some of the challenges that we have in ESCO and to allow us to transition, but also to allow the economy to grow. Mm -hmm. You can never grow the economy if you can't supply energy. You can never grow the economy if you can't move the goods that you produce. So sorting out also the logistics and making sure that we can open the logistics sector to private sector participation, I think is one of the major issues that still need to be sorted out. Energy, I'm fairly comfortable, mm -hmm. but I think in the logistics sector, we need to see more reforms to allow for private sector participation. We have started, but I don't think we have moved fast enough. Uh, sir, uh, a great point to end this discussion. Uh, thanks once again for joining us in studio, uh, recapping some of the highlights coming out of the 2024 uh, Investment uh, Summit uh, hosted uh, by a Standard Bank in Dubai, aiming to mobilize the further capital, of course, into South Africa's infrastructure space from the Middle East region. I was joined by Kenny Fisha, CEO of Corporate and Investment Banking at Africa's largest uh, lender. But uh, from myself, Fifi Peters, uh, for now, it is goodbye.